and just by his power we trust his love. Great is the Lord, he is faithful and true, by his mercy he proves his love. Great is the Lord and worthy of glory, great is the Lord and worthy of praise. I'm the interim pastor of Wyoming Presbyterian Church. It's my distinct honor and pleasure to welcome all of you here out on the lawn and all of those who are tuning in with us on Facebook and on YouTube later on the week if you want to catch it on demand. I have a few announcements that I know we are all so grateful for this good weather that continues. We've had so many Sunday or sunny Sundays. Um, and it's always a blessing to be able to meet out here. We do have a few rules that we are abiding by in our communal life together, our life in community. Um, that is that uh, while you are on church premises, all of us will keep our mask on uh, and, and follow the science, follow the, the protocols for being safe together. Um, there are a few adjustments that we've made to our service uh, to accommodate these strange pandemic um, circumstances that we live under. The first is that we're not having um, a, a pass around offering. And so we do hope you will continue to give online. It's pretty easy to do so. I do it. Um, you just go to the website and, and you can follow the link there. And there are also directions in the bulletin. If you do want to give a, a loose offering, that's what we call as church speak for a cash offering, there is a basket over here and, and we welcome that as well as you uh, exit the premises. Um, today we are doing an interesting thing. It's World Communion Sunday. Every year, the first Sunday of October is World Communion Sunday. So people all over the world are taking communion. We, we join our hearts and minds with all those who are taking communion today and we remember that we are not a church that's based in Milburn but a universal church that spans the, enti the entire globe. In that vein we do have um, something interesting that I don't think we've ever done here before. Uh, normally when I'm at table I say we're taking communion by intinction or uh, ushers will bring you your communion today. We're doing communion on the go, as it were. 
Um, so if you do not have your packet, you can raise your hand and uh, our fine usher and clerk of session over here, Dave Barry, will bring you the plate. Uh, but while we are taking communion, we will, there's a little wafer here. It's amazing the technology these days. So there's a little wafer here. We're gonna peel off the plastic, take the bread together, the wafer. Um, and then when it's time to take the cup together, we'll peel off another layer and we'll drink the cup together. I, I do believe this is wine. Um, so if you do not wanna drink wine, you can just, um, make a cross or um, you don't have to drink it right <laughs> oh Sandy is it is it's juice it's juice it's, it's juice. juice wonderful okay it's a miracle okay <laughs> uh, we also have gluten free of <laughs> Wine into water. It's a miracle. Ask and ye shall receive. Okay, we also have gluten free, so we have like a little bit of a buffet sit situation here. If you do need uh, gluten free, and it actually looks like a little wine glass there. And Sandy, is that grape juice as well? Okay, it's grape juice, so we're good. Confirmed, both are grape juice. Uh, <laughs> All right, so um, that's how we're going to do communion. Excited to do that together today. And um, we're now gonna shift and, and gather our hearts and minds around God's word. Let us start with the call to worship and all of these parts will be coming from different churches around the world, all, all of the liturgy. This comes from the Presbyterian Church of Columbia. Please join me in this call to worship. We gather from the west to the east, from south to north, to celebrate the God of peace who accompanies us in our acts of peace. This God, God of peace, peace accompanies us in each and every circumstance around us. Let us worship God. All who are able, please stand for our first hymn, our opening hymn, In Christ There Is No East or West. goodness we recognize our failings in the knowledge of God's mercy we dare tell the truth about ourselves and our world in the confidence of God's children let us confess our sins gracious Lord creator of this universe in your generosity you have given us a world of abundance and diversity yet we live guided by greed and selfishness we confess that we have defaced your creation and poisoned our environment through our consumerist behavior and for personal gain. In Christ, you made us brothers and sisters and intended for us to be united. And yet we have built walls to separate us from those who are different from us. You gave us wisdom and creativity and we use those to trick each other and to develop weapons of destruction and death. You gave us laws to order our lives 
and we have abused them to take revenge and punish our enemies. We love war rather than strive for peace. We ignore the poor and the weak and honor the rich and powerful. In all this, we have not lived according to your will. Forgive us, Lord, for daring to boast in our human achievements and for failing to recognize that you alone are worthy of praise. In your mercy, forgive us our sins. Amen. God accepted us simply because of our faith in Christ, through whom our sins were forgiven. May God help us to continue to preach peace to those who are near and far. Amen. Please join me in praying for God to guide our proclamation of Holy Word with our prayer for illumination. Let us pray. Holy Spirit, grant us openness and give us understanding of what each one of us needs to see through Holy Scripture. When we are facing a difficult choice between the easy and the right decision, help us to choose the narrow path. We also pray for who who are about to set out on an adventurous journey of faith anywhere in the world. Amen. Our first reading this morning comes from the book of Exodus, chapter 20, verses 1 through 4, 7 through 9, and 12 through 20. Listen for the word of God. Then God spoke all these words, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above, or that is on earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. Honor your father and your mother so that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You should not covet your neighbor's wife or male or female slave or ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. When all the people witnessed the thunder and lightning, the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking, they were afraid and trembled and stood at a distance and said to Moses, you speak to us and we will listen, but do not let God speak to us or we will die. Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid, for God has come only to test you and to put the fear of him upon you so that you do not sin. This is the word of the Lord for which we say, Thanks. into the wilderness and so a couple weeks ago we visited the Israelites in the wilderness and, and they have progressed at this point to the point of receiving the law uh, Moses receiving the law on Mount Sinai that's what we just heard and so our parallel story in the New Testament as the Israelites are grounding themselves in Scripture we are walking with Jesus Jesus has just entered into Jerusalem and he has cleansed the 
<laughs> uh, we've got some tech technological issues, I think, right now. But um, can can everybody hear? I'm going to have to put on my preacher voice then. Okay. <laughs> oh, there we go. <laughs> All right. Um, bread from heaven, everyone. Bread from heaven. Okay. So um, Jesus has come into Jerusalem. He has cleansed the temple. He said, none of the shenanigans where uh, my father's house is. And he's had some folks from the temple come and challenge him. And he told a story last, last week about those who say yes and end up saying no, and those who say no, but then end up saying yes. And, and how that sometimes can apply to us as religious people and people who might not fit the mold. Sometimes religious folks say yes, but they get too scared when it gets hard. And the other way around, sometimes people on the periphery say no, but then are called into this bigger thing that we call faith. So today we're continuing on with Jesus. He again is talking to these religious authorities and uh, that is the situation as we pick up in Matthew 21, verses 33 to, thir to 46. Friends, listen now to the word of the Lord. Listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he leased it to tenants and went to another country. When the, uh, when the harvest time had come, he sent his slaves to the tenants to collect his produce. But the tenants seized his slaves and beat one, killed another, stoned another. Again, he sent other slaves more than the first. They treated them in the same way. Finally, he sent his son to them saying, they will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, this is the heir, come, let us kill him and get his inheritance. So they seized him, they threw him out of the vineyard and they killed him. Now, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to these tenants? They said to him, he will put those wretches to a miserable death and lease the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the produce at the harvest time. Jesus said to them, have you never read the scriptures? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing and it is amazing in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people that produces the fruits of the kingdom. The one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces and it will crush anyone to whom it falls. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard this parable, they realized that he was speaking about them. They wanted to arrest them, but they feared the crowds because they regarded him as a prophet. Friends, this is the word of the Lord for which we say, thanks be to God. So here in Milburn, I think that we are safely, we could say, and in the land of milk and honey, it is a, a land with green trees and lots of resources. Um, and I hail from a similar area in suburb of Atlanta. I remember being out in the wilderness and taking communion in a different way than I ever had before. Now, it wasn't in the context of a worship service. I was out with one of our mission partners while I was an intern on the U.S.-Mexico border in a ministry called Frontera de Cristo. And it was a, a ministry that was on both sides of the border in Douglas, Arizona, and in Agua Prieta, Mexico, in the Sonoran Desert. And we had a lot of different ministries under the umbrella of this uh, of this ministry and so and a lot of partners and so one of those things that this ministry did was partner with 
a drug rehab center on the Mexican side of the border um, and put vats of water, big barrels of water out on ranches on the Mexican side for immigrants who are coming through in the heat of the sun. And, and the backstory of that was uh, many of those immigrants who are migrating from central Mexico and also southern or Central America and, and Southern Mexico were coming up in the heat of the summer and the most deaths occurred in that Sonoran desert uh, crossing the Arizona border. And so there were ranch owners who agreed to put water barrels on their side so that folks who are immigrating would not die of thirst. And uh, we were on the back of uh, Raul's truck and he brought out a, a cooler and it had a bunch of burritos in it. <clears throat> he passed around the burritos and he said, I want to tell you my story. And the story uh, was the story of how he left his homeland in, in Chiapas, Mexico, uh, out of economic necessity. And he dreamt of greener pastures on the U.S. side. He had hired a, a coyote, uh, he had crossed successfully, and he thought once he got to the U.S., he ended up going to Las Vegas, he thought once he got to the U.S. that he was gonna be living his best life. But what he found was that he had few rights, that he was uh, washing dishes nonstop in the kitchen of a casino and that his employer took a lot of advantage of him. And so he found himself drinking more and more and eventually returning back to Mexico. Now, the, the good part of the story is that he ended up turning these lemons into lemonade. He dedicated his life to being part of drug rehabilitation for immigrants who were in that same predicament returned to the Mexican side of the border, he would help and support them and try to point them towards resources so that they could get grounded in um, their lives in Mexico. This is, of course, an illustration, though. He shared his story so, to give a human side of the migration and of, of the system that all of us are part of in some way. It illustrates how broken our our systems are here in the US and in Mexico as well and all around the world. And what we look at today when we hear Jesus telling this parable, when we join him on the ground in Jerusalem, we hear him talking about another system that is broken, that is complicit with a power, one that is not free from evil. Today's parable, Jesus is speaking out in a way against the religious systems that were meant to uplift and to edify, but instead were serving those in power instead of serving God's people. If you remember from last week's text, Jesus had arrived in Jerusalem with a multitude of people, and where we centered our focus last week was in that questioning of Jesus. And Jesus answered the, the question, by what authority do you do these things? With a question back to them, testing them if he could trust them and testing them if they were gonna be honest. They failed that test, but our takeaway from last week was that Jesus' authority was rooted in God. This week we see a similar situation. He's telling a parable again, and you find in Jesus' dialogue with folks, very rarely does he give a direct answer to a question. I think it's only like once or twice in all of the Gospels do we get a direct answer from Jesus. And in this story, he tells uh, about an owner of a vineyard. We have to interpret that as being God. And he appoints these tenants, which was a common practice in, in those days. He appoints these tenants to oversee the people who are working out in the fields. And when these people who come from the fields uh, approach the tenants, they mistreat them. They abuse them. They have the power and they use it. 
Then the son of the owner goes out and the, the owner of the vineyard thinks there's no way that they can mistreat my son. And the son shows up and they mistreat and they kill him as well. The point of the story, of course, is that even though these tenants have been given power, they have not used their power justly. So we ask the question, how does this story speak to us today? And what we find is that the scriptures still speak to us today. Now, if you ask different people how they interpret this, you might hear different questions because our country is going through a reckoning right now and we're heading right into crazy season of politics, right? So amidst all of this, our, our context where we've got the coronavirus and we've got police brutality and racial injustice, we've, we've got all of these things going on and people landing on one side or the other of how to respond. Now, if you ask Christians where they see the church's role in all of this, it depends on who you ask. You ask people in the black church, they've always leaned hard on the Exodus narrative. Justice is in their blood. We hear Martin Luther King Jr. quoting frequently scriptures from the Old Testament about justice. And in the white church, it seems to be a little bit more split. So it seems like we who are mostly white in the Presbyterian church are out in the wilderness and we're trying to make heads or tails of it. And we're trying to figure out how to respond in the midst of all that's going on in the midst of the chaos with people who are really looking for moral guidance. Now, when I get disoriented, I often look to theologians to find a little bit of guidance. These are people who have thought long and hard about the scriptures and can draw meaning and help us make meaning out of our circumstances. And one person I look to is Reinhold Niebuhr, who is probably the most famous white theologian of the 20th century. Um, he was from German roots and he was a pastor in Michigan in, in the midst of the civil rights movement. He did write a, a prayer that's famous, uh, that has been co-opted by Alcoholics Anonymous, um, the, the Serenity Prayer, if you're familiar with that. But he uh, really was in the midst of, of the fight for justice and, and equality. He marched alongside Martin Luther King Jr. And he wrote a book called Moral Man, Immoral Society. And later on he said, I really should have written the book title as Immoral Man, or person now that we're in the 21st century, More Immoral Society. Because when you get groups involved, that you get the group think and um, evil kind of snowballs from there, right? And so he, he talked about in this book that despite the centuries of experiences that we have as people, as men and women, we have not yet learned to live together in peace and harmony. And it is hard to be part of these experiences without being covered ourselves in mud and in blood. That's the way he puts it. It's not necessary to study the whole of human history. We can look at the Exodus story, look at the Pharaoh. The Pharaoh doesn't even have a name. It doesn't really matter. He's part of that system of oppression. When we look at the Holocaust, we look at the German church that was complicit with the Nazis with, and, and supported the Nazis. When out of that, we get one of our Presbyterian confessions, the Barman Confession, the Barman Declaration, excuse me, that responded to the German church's complicity with the Nazis. We also see the white church in the 60s being complicit in that fight for civil rights of African Americans, using scripture to support why things should slow down, why we don't need to move for justice. Now people in our day have not stopped with the power grab, 
we see that with our politicians on both sides, on both sides. Um, there's a danger of not taking care of God's people and the vineyards. There is a danger of not respecting that which belongs to God, which is every single human who's been created and come into earth, right? So the questions we have to ask ourselves really seriously, because the, um, the theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer talked about grace, but grace being free, but not cheap. So in order to get to grace, you have to walk that path of repentance and seek forgiveness, right? You don't just get forgiveness without that crucial step of reflection. And so if we are serious about our task as Christians, our task of going out as religious people, going out into society and caring for all of God's creation, we have to ask, how are we complicit in these systems? This is what the parable is about. Where do we accept the status quo and where do we fight for the values of the kingdom? Where have we rejected that cornerstone? Where have we seen a stranger and rejected that person and in doing that rejected our Lord Jesus Christ as well? We've all done that because we're human and every human has fallen short of the glory of God. We live in this tension. But I do believe there's hope. I heard a, a story this week from the presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church, Bishop Michael Curry. Uh, if you don't know who he is, but you did tune in to the wedding of Prince Harry and Meghan Markle, then you know who he is. He's the uh, African-American charismatic guy who talks about the way of love. And he just had a book come out this week entitled The Way of Love. And he talks about how he came to be in the Episcopal Church, was, which was by way of his mother, Dorothy, and his father. And the story is that his father was a Baptist preacher. He'd been licensed. He was in seminary. He went to seminary up in, in Chicago. And he met Bishop Curry's mother, Dorothy, who was a student at the University of Chicago. And she had already become Episcopalian. And so this was in the 1940s after the war. And Bishop Curry's father goes, oh, okay, I've got to check out. All I know is Baptist. And I've got to figure out what this woman who I'm interested in is doing over the Episcopalian church. So he goes to church with her one week and uh, one Sunday and they walk in and they are the only African Americans in the in, entire joint and in the entire sanctuary. They walk in and, and they sit in the back and then Bishop Curry's father just kind of watches. And at, at some point, you know, they had the, all the liturgy and they had the sermon, and then they come to the part of communion. And Bishop Curry's mother, Dorothy, gets up and she walks to the front, and this is the way the Episcopalians do it. They, they walk to the front, they walk to the altar, and then the priest serves every single one, first the bread and then the wine, the cup. And they drink from the same chalice. So he watched and, and Dorothy was on that long line of folks at the altar and everybody received the bread and he thought, okay, you know, they gave her the bread, all right, but what's gonna happen with the chalice? So he watches the priest, the priest starts at the one end of the altar and moves down. Each white person drinks out of the chalice and they goes down the line and then gets Dorothy and he goes, what's gonna happen here? The priest gives her the chalice and she drinks out of it like each person had before. And Bishop Curry's father goes, okay, she drank from the chalice. What's going to happen next? And to his great surprise, the priest moved on to the next person, a white person who was sitting next to Dorothy, gave the chalice to this person. The person drank from it. And that was the moment when Bishop Curry's father decided to become Episcopalian 
because he said, and he told the story this way, if there was a church that would give the chalice to a white person and a black person and they could commune together, that was the beginning of the kingdom. And though the Episcopalian church didn't live up to its ideals in the future and still doesn't, none, none of our churches do, though it didn't live up to its ideals completely, he knew that that was a, a taste of the kingdom right there. Communion with black and white and everything in between. Everybody was welcome at that table. And that's where I think that we have some hope here on World Communion Sunday. We embrace diversity and we embrace Jesus' call to something bigger. We get caught up in the weeds but every single week we return and at the beginning of our liturgy, we start with confession. We confess that we have not gotten it all right. And we clear ourselves and open ourselves to God's word, speaking to us every single week and every day, to be honest. And we open ourselves to that invitation to take from the heavenly table where all people, no matter what their difference is, gather around and share in God's vision of hope, love, peace, and justice. That's the first step that we do. We, we start with communion and then our whole life is going out and inviting people to the table. And though this seems daunting, I did hear this saying when I lived in the South, is that God doesn't call the equipped God equips the called. That is that even though we can feel overwhelmed with the circumstances of the world, ever, even though we can feel overwhelmed by what is going on around us, even if we feel unmoored, even if we feel like we can't live up to this divine calling, we're all called into it. And it doesn't have to be decent and in order. It can be messy. We are all called into the work of the kingdom. So as Jesus calls each of us to be part of these people who lay the stones down of the foundation, let us ground our mission in that cornerstone, Jesus Christ, the stone that the builders rejected, but the cornerstone of our faith. I share this in the name of the one who was and is and is to come. Amen. We're gonna continue now with our worship and we're going to respond to this word from God using an affirmation of faith, which is rooted in the Belhar Confession. That is a confession that the Peace USA adopted uh, and was put together in the Reformed Church in South Africa following apartheid. So we're gonna share those universal words, those universal truths and you can uh, recite what's written in the bulletin. So I ask you, Wyoming Church, what is it that you believe? We believe in one holy universal Christian church, the unity of the communion of saints of the entire human family. And we believe that this unity of the people of God must be manifest and active in that we love one another, that we give ourselves willingly and joyfully to one another that we share one baptism together, that we eat of one bread and drink of one cup together, that we confess one name, one Lord, for one cause, with one hope, which is the height and the breadth and the depth and the love of Christ forever and ever. Amen. Friends, all who are able, please stand for our next song, our, hum our communion hymn, Just As I Am. This is a uh, favorite of the Reverend Dr. Billy Graham.
just as I am without one being, but have my blood washed for me, and that thou bidst me come to Just as I am, though tossed about with many a conflict, many a doubt, fightings and fears within, without, oh, Friends, as we gather around this table in a, a way that we never have before, we still proclaim this truth that we hear in scriptures that people will come from east and west, from north and south, and sit at table. This is our faith that all who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ are welcome around this table. All are invited to participate in this feast of love. And so we begin our time together with prayer. Let us pray. Creator God, from every place on this planet, we turn our face to you, O oh God. Gather us, all your people, together to pray. In the midst of the forces which would separate us, bind us in your love as the church together. Strengthen us through the grace of your people gathered, no matter how we gather, in person or virtually, with the truth of your presence. In a world aching to be made new, we cry out with those who suffer the pains of what powers and principalities extract from the world's poorest. We cry out with those suffering from illness and disease at whom the world turns a callous glance. We cry out with those stinging from the sins of white supremacy. We cry out with those seeking justice, equality, and peace. Peace at all times, in all ways. In a world stretching towards wholeness, we celebrate with those whose lives bear the fruit of your spirit and seek to share in your call to partnership. We celebrate with those whose efforts are making the world new. We celebrate with all those who gather to earnestly seek your transforming work in the world. God, make us a world that continues into the shape of your communion table, long and wide with endless seats, where all are welcomed and all are fed, none go hungry. Make us a people who grow your family by practices of mutuality and generosity and justice. May we be found to be witnesses when Jesus returns to the truth of who we were created to be, people who belong to you, people who belong to each other. God, in this space, we lift up to you, especially those who are on our hearts and our own individual concerns as well. We lift them up to you in this silence. God, as you join us in this place, you promise that you will never leave or forsake us. Continue to guide us 
as we walk alongside those who are hurting. And now we pray the prayer our Lord Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, this is the story that we tell of our faith, the, the story that we tell over and over again, that's at the heart of what we do as community, is that Jesus, on the night in which he was betrayed, was sitting with his friends, the disciples, and he blessed the bread, and he took it, and he broke it, and he said, this is my body broken for you. Whenever you eat of this, do this in remembrance of me. And in like manner, after supper, he took the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant by my blood, which is shed for you. Anytime you drink of this cup, do so in remembrance of me. So that friends, every time that we eat of this bread and we drink of this cup, we proclaim the saving death of our Lord Jesus Christ until he comes again and come again he shall. Friends, these are the gifts of God for the people of God. Amen. Now, as I mentioned before, we are taking uh, communion in a, a 21st century kind of way. And so you, you have what you need here. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and peel off that first layer. Friends, this is the bread of life. Now we're going to peel the second layer. Friends, this is the cup of salvation.
God, we give you thanks for what you have called us into, a higher calling, which is that of being your body, of being your hands and feet in the world. We confess that sometimes this calling is hard, that at times we don't live up to it. And yet we thank you for this open invitation that you have for us to come to supper, to gather around this table as your people, as your sons and daughters, brothers and sisters in Christ. We thank you that we do so not alone, but join with Christians all over the world, with different stripes and different in all different ways, but with one mission, your love and peace and hope and justice in the world. We pray these things in Christ's name, amen. benediction. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forever. God's people say, Amen. Amen.